All right, we'll start three, <clears throat> two. What's good, everybody? Welcome to Unfair Sports. We have a special episode as we're going to react to the OU Nebraska game. I got some special guests with me here on the channel. We got my main man, Preston Gann, over at the PG Show. What's good, Preston? What's going on? Thank you for having me on. Thank, thank you for joining us. We got Chris with the K from the Horns Down podcast. What's good, my man? Not much, man. <laughs> just chilling, just chilling, enjoying uh, this victory Sunday, right? All right, right. It's a great feeling. It's a great feeling to have. And I told all my viewers we we're going to have this special episode to celebrate this game because I think this was a critical game in the season. So before we start, I'm going to do what my boy Ty Hayes does. Jump in the comments. Let me know how you're feeling this day this will probably launch on monday so you tell me you got two days in your system how do you feel about this game drop down in the comments and let us know before we jump right into it preston where can they find you uh yeah y'all can find me on twitter at the pg show you guys can find me on youtube apple spotify or google podcasts just the pg show sweet chris where can they find the horns down podcast as well as hey, yourself you you guys can find us at the Horns Down Pod. You see my Twitter handle on there. Find me on Twitter there as well. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. Shout out to my guy, Seth Oliveris. Follow him at Seth Oliveris, always giving us the best and some of the funniest uh, uh, Texas troll content out there. So, <laughs> yeah, you can find us guys all over. <laughs> Exactly. And we love to troll those uh, Longhorns and we may actually dive into them a little bit later, but we're going to start off with the most important thing for the day. How y'all feeling? How y'all feeling this morning? How y'all feeling right after this 49 to 14 victory that the Sooners handed to the Cornhuskers in Lincoln, Nebraska? We'll start with you, Chris. How do you feel this morning? Man, actually, I feel feel pretty damn good about what 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 we saw yesterday you know pg and i we talked about this at length uh, i think probably the, really the biggest surprise from that game was just how we went up there and handled business this was a true business trip they went up there they took care of business they executed they did exactly what they needed to do there was some cause for concern after that first touchdown but after the, they settled in made their adjustments or whatnot they got they got to them. They were able to get they were able to get home. I think it was interesting to see that three man front at first and see how they were able to rush the ball and able to kind of pick up some pass, you know, quick pass plays and stuff like that. But man, after a while, they just settled in and then sacks. Um, you know, you're 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 just all over the field with everybody from the Sean White to Canick to my guy. Uh, Oh, say uh, to my guy, uh, Billy Bowman, all of them. Key Lawrence mm -hmm. was active uh, yesterday. It was a really great feeling, man. I was really excited about it, but I'm feeling pretty damn good. I'm feeling really encouraged about what I saw. Next week is K-State. Got to put the helmet back on. Got to get a lunch pill in our hand and go right back to work <laughs> on Monday and get ready for it because that's going to still be a test. Granted, they lost to Tulane. But we still know what climbing uh, is capable of doing. We saw for the past three years having to kind of go through the ups and downs with with him. But uh, man, you can't be you can't be anything but encouraged by what you saw yesterday. And we'll definitely jump into the next game a little bit later. But PG, how you feeling? How are you feeling this morning? I'm feeling real good. Uh, the Sooners answered the one question that I had for them all week, which is how are you going to go into an environment with 90,000 people screaming at you and how are you going to respond, right? How are you going to be disciplined? Because this was a question I think that we had for Dylan Gabriel uh, and a lot of these newer guys coming on the scene. This is an environment that a lot of them have never played in before. And let's be honest, OU does not get to go on the road very much and play in these kind of environments now that you know, the Aggies aren't here and Nebraska aren't in our conference. And so I think they responded really well. Uh, they only had five penalties. And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think I saw a single false start penalty all game yesterday from the offensive line and Dylan Gabriel, which impresses me. The offensive line looked leaps and bounds better than they have been. And, uh, yeah, I just feel really good uh, about the Sooners going in to K-State. 
granted i agree and so for me feelings of course i dropped a video earlier this morning for the the viewers to get an understanding of my thoughts about it but raw emotion i was happy it was exactly what i expected us to do going out there in lincoln nebraska me and upg talked about it before the expectations of the nebraska corn huskers in this game was they were going to play hard they did that they busted their butt for one drive after that drive it was done it was over the honeymoon period ended the it all fizzled away the champagne went flat the soda went flat and oklahoma went there and dominated and i love the point on the offensive line actually not committing any false starts because that's a big issue we had wanye morris obviously shows us that that was a key component of chemistry for this line i didn't think that it was going to be that big of a deal oh yeah it, it, it changed everything you saw them look like they were more in sync you it looked like they were, had more chemistry it looked like they knew what the hell they were doing for a change so let's jump right into the offense i want to start i want to go each portion i want to go from offense to defense and then we can kind of just give some parting shots on everything so first off what was your thoughts on the offense chris how did you feel about the way that they were playing going into this hostile environment because pg made was said it perfectly Ninety thousand fans oh you gets to do it every once in a while it's usually a neutral site game luckily this we've done the ohio state game we've now done the nebraska game where we're traveling to hostile environments and we'll get more of that stuff especially in the sec but out of conference it's a great way to measure yourself how did you feel about the way the offense responded going up there to nebraska so overall uh, like I said, I've been giving out these grades to the, to, to the offense and the defense to the team overall. Overall, to the offense, I still give it about a, a B minus. I give the team overall pretty much a B, but I still give it a B minus simply because there there are some miscues. We'll get to that. Um, but overall, man, you're pleased with what you saw. Gray looked really good as well, uh, running the ball. The running backs all over, I mean, actually looked really good running the ball. Receivers were able to get open. You saw – some flashes from Weiss, you saw Farouk, you saw some things that you really liked there. They were actually involved this game, so that was really good. Um, Gabriel, Gabriel finally got the protection that he actually needed to be able to do all the things that he was able to do yesterday, so you're happy about that. Matoir, uh, he looked good finally in an OU uniform, and then Wanye Morris, I think he, he may have been the missing link, the missing piece to that offensive line for chemistry and some continuity purposes. Uh, but with that said, I think Gabriel, there, there's still some things that need to they need to gel on or gel better at, which is obviously the deep ball. Some of those uh, he missed the pass to uh, Farouk. Um, and if he put some air under it to uh, uh, to Weiss on that one pass uh, to the in the end zone, he probably that's probably a touchdown as well. So some of those miscues and then obviously some of the sacks or whatnot, I think that he could maybe probably step up in the pocket be a little bit more decisive with with what he wants to do does he want to throw it away does he want to go if he doesn't see anything but overall you can't you can't really fault him because the offense is moving at such a great speed you're able to um on third downs it seems it, it seems like to me that drake stoops is our third down guy slants little things over the middle or whatnot you're really excited about that so uh the biggest thing is for me is just to see that steady improvement and see this offense uh, begin to gel as they start to open up more of the offense. You know, it's kind of funny because they, it's like Urban, uh, Meyer, Joe Klatt, and all those guys were like, oh, man, it's like they finally opened up the offense. I don't know necessarily if they opened up the offense. You saw a few wrinkles, but I don't necessarily know if you opened it up all the way. I think what you saw was just our, our Joes were better than their Joes, you know? So, that's a good point. That's a uh, that's a really good point. And yeah. and the playbook part, you're right. The, I think the thing for me is it looked like they did go to page three. Yeah. But they stayed about halfway through it, which is kind of what you want in a game like this. Yeah. K-State's coming up. But this makes the most sense to, you know, get something out there. So, no, you, I think you made a good point with that. Yeah. And, I mean, hey, I'll just end it here and just say, like, I, I think that you kept things vanilla. I think that Farouk – if you watch Farouk closely, his footwork is just straight silly. I mean, it, he's he's getting open. He's beating guys like like I didn't I didn't think he. I don't necessarily think that he's blazing fast, but as far as knowing how to 
you know, maneuver around that defender and get open, not get jammed or not get, you know, caught up, just, you know, being totally covered. He's able to get open. Weiss as well. So with that being said, man, I, like I said, B minus. I think there's just a couple of miscues or some things, but you went up there and you handled business and you looked dominant, uh, especially after that first drive. You didn't look back after that drive. PG, what you thinking? What you think about the offense going up there into that hostile environment in Lincoln and making it actually happen? Uh-oh, I think we lost your audio, my man. Are you muted? Are you muted? Yeah, Chris, I wasn't laughing at you. Um, I, I was just looking at these AP polls, and they're garbage. So, um, anyways, we'll, the we'll jump into the we'll jump into the AP <laughs> poll at the end. We will, but go ahead. Um, yeah, no, the offense was really good. Uh, it looked like it was uh, really clicking. Uh, you know, at the beginning, obviously there was that. You know, they didn't score right off the bat, which I. Chris, you talked about it yesterday, but oh, you know, us as OU fans, we're spoiled. Uh, Oh, you coming out the gate and scoring uh, the first drive every single game. I don't think we're going to see a lot of that, especially as we go into Big 12 play. But you'll definitely see the offense turn it up, uh, depending on what kind of defensive schemes they're seeing. And I think we saw that yesterday. The one thing I do want to see is, is Dylan Gabriel be a little bit more accurate. It seemed like there was a couple passes that he missed that he should have been able to make. But then he made passes that are like NFL-style throws. Mm -hmm. And so I need to see him be a little bit more consistent uh, and, you know, get that completion percentage up a little bit. But other than that, like the offense did really well. I was very impressed with the running game. Once again, it looks like we have a good star in Javante Barnes. Uh, and then Eric Gray looks to be that first, second and third down back that we expected to see last year that we didn't. And I know a lot of OU fans were down on him. And Marcus Major, he had 12 carries. And he only had 35 yards. But Marcus Major, you know, he caught a pass for 24. And, you know, I, I think, you know, as Marcus Major continues to get back into that offense, you'll see him put a little bit more production in there. Uh, I agree with the Drake Stoops. Drake Stoops is going to be that guy. You have a third down, like a third and short, a fourth and short, or you're in the red zone. Drake Stupid is your guy to throw the ball to. Uh, he is very reliable. He's going to catch the ball. Uh, and I think he's going to be a great NFL slot receiver one day. So, but yeah, yeah I, I'm pretty impressed with this offense. They look good. They look to be able to turn it up whenever they need to. But I do just want to see the passing game be a little bit more consistent. I want to see Mims and Weiss get about seven to eight touches each every, every single game. No, I'm with you on that. And to to add to the Drake Stoops piece, he's definitely got the Wes Welker, Julian Edelman role going for himself to where he's just going to get into the hole, get into a hole, catch it, and get the first down or get some, maybe some additional yak or whatnot. But, yeah, I think I think Drake is definitely that player that now teams have to pay attention to, which should, should open things up even more for Jaleel Farouk as well as Marvin Mims and Braid Willis as well as Jaden Gibson when he gets back out there, the giant that runs a 4-4. Uh, you, get, you get all of those combinations. The offense is, is just primed to be explosive. And that was the thing that jumped out to me, too. After that first dri uh, drive, and Dylan kind of looked hesitant. That sack was unnecessary. He probably should have either thrown it away or thrown it down the field. It looks like Levy is always filling out the defense the first series. Like, he's yeah. just taking his time. He's like, nah, let's not rush much. Let's just... We, we want to run a hurry up offense and up tempo, but we're not going to really do anything crazy. I want to see what they're going to be doing. And then the second series, it's like, boom, okay, go do your thing. And I was like, except first, of course, it's like everybody else. We have PTSD. We're all worn out. Like really five and out. And then we give up a touchdown right behind it. Oh God. These are the same, the same era, Lincoln Riley, same thing. We're getting the same type of defense, same type of offense. Everything's going to freak out. Everybody had PTSD. And then all of a sudden, the floodgates open and we look up the ha at halftime is 35 to seven. That tells you that once this offense gets rolling, it's going to be nothing but downhill. But with Eric Gray, I am, I'm happy to see that he's turning out who he is. Mm -hmm. I'll have an apology video coming out about him. He is the apology video because I am the idiot that I didn't say he was bad. That's the thing though. I will say that I didn't say he was bad. I just said, I didn't feel like he was a feature back. I felt like he was more of a change of pace guy. I think he's the feature back, 
and a change of pace guy. And I think Major is the thunder to his lightning whenever he actually gets going in the game. So I like this. I like seeing what they did with the run game. I like seeing that Dylan Gabriel was trying to sling it hard. I'm disappointed we didn't get 200. We got 230 yards and not 300, which makes me leads to this question. I'm going to throw this out there at y'all. Can we still consider Dylan Gabriel top 10 in the Heisman now? Did no, he just did throw himself out of it? Yeah, he's not even a top five quarterback right I, now. In I don't. Football. I'm going to hold that thought simply because not a lot of quarterbacks have really had. Look, um, Anthony Richardson. He had a Heisman moment, but he doesn't have the Heisman numbers. Nope. Um, that man is poo-poo. Bryce Young is really the – out of everybody, Bryce Young. And so I was talking to my uncle about this actually this morning, and I told him, I said, hey, I think that um, the clear favorite, nobody's saying it right now simply because it's – you know they really haven't played anybody. But numbers-wise, if you just want to go out for numbers, Caleb Williams is probably your clear yep. favorite. With yep. Bryce Young being a close second simply because he already had a Heisman moment against Texas. But uh, when you look at Bryce Young as well going down, to, uh, going through the season, you're going to see uh, a few games, Kentucky, Tennessee. Uh, well, probably, you know, obviously you'll see Georgia and probably the championship game. But you'll see Kentucky, Tennessee, um, Arkansas. So he's going to have all those chances to put up really good numbers and have more Heisman moments, right? So outside mm-hmm. of that, it's still a really, a really, really young season. Not a lot of teams have done too much. Not a lot of teams have played uh, a lot of different teams. So um, you're going to see, uh, you know what? I hell, I even throw Stetson Bennett's name in there simply because just really by default, you know, that Oregon game was was a really great coming out party for him, and then also just what he's been able to do these past two weeks, which is honestly just live off the defense and just go down there and execute, right? So. With that being said, I mean, those are the three right now, but Dylan Gabriel, trust me, if they keep going at this pace that they're going at and they're winning, he most likely will get an invite, in my opinion, because OU is going to be the hot story. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. They're, they're the they're the media topic, and that, that was why I feel like this game had some critical components to the seasons because this was the game that the national media was paying attention to. This is yeah. the one that everyone penciled for the Brent Venables era. Let's see what he does when he goes up to Nebraska up there at the school that's considered has the most loyal fans because they've sold out 215 straight games at 35. the crib. I'm sorry? It's I think it's 325. Something like that. Crazy. The numbers are stupid. That's all I'm going to say. Straight. It's just that it, everybody shows up to those games. And they still suck. But people still show up to those games. <laughs> so you have to give them mad props for that loyalty. So you're guaranteed to walk in there and it's going to be a ton of people. It's not going to be like at a USC or UCLA game where half the stands is not even there. Hell, I think UCLA had maybe 2,000 people at their last game at the Rose Bowl. Granted, it's hard to get to Pasadena. I've done it once. It's almost, it's really hard to get out there. They got to bust you there. It's hard. But the Rose Bowl is still beautiful. Outside of that point, I'm thinking that with this, Dylan need that was the game for him to have a Heisman moment. Now, two touchdowns and a rushing touchdown is cool. But you're right, Chris. My top three right now is is Caleb Williams, C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young. And it's only because Caleb has all those rushing touchdowns on top of all of his passing touchdowns. I mean, he's gotten five touchdown passes. Yeah, Yeah, he's gotten five touchdowns already to uh, Jordan Addison as he's gotten them there. So the numbers are there for him. He's looking like probably – and, I mean, hell, everybody's in the power rankings is moving USC up even higher because of how dominant they've started the season off. Now, we'll see – what it looks like later on when they face like Utah, Oregon, and teams that may actually have better de- – and, hell, Washington, because they're looking good. But I'll digress. I feel like Dylan's situation is he's going to have to have some 400-yard games if he wants to be considered for it. It's going to be a stat stuffer's uh, mm-hmm. award this year. And the, the quarterback with the most stats will probably be the one that ends up winning it. Yeah, can I – I'm going to jump in here with this real quick. Uh, top five quarterbacks for me right now in college football is – Michael Penix Jr., and here's why. Well, why? one, hasn't been sacked at all this season. Zero sacks. He's thrown for 1,079 yards and has 10 touchdowns. Only one interception. Really not anybody else that's doing it better. And no. then I would have Tanner Mordecai up there in the top five right now over at SMU. He's got great weapons. He's got over 1,000 yards, 
10 touchdowns. Now, he does have three interceptions and three sacks, but he's playing just about as good as anybody. And then I would have C.J. Stroud up there. I would have Stetson Bennett in there, and I would have Caleb Williams. But I would keep a real close eye on Michael Penix Jr. and Tanner Mordecai as the season goes through and progresses because those two guys probably have the easiest path to continue putting up the numbers that they're putting up and look probably the most dominant with their teams. I can't because Mordecai is turnover prone. I saw what he did last year. He started off really hot. Then he folded towards the end of the season. And then uh Penix, can he actually make it through the year? I mean, and then it's Washington, Washington is, I mean, to be honest with you, what they did against Michigan state, it was totally expected. Michigan State is is a fraud. Their quarterback is not good. He got he has uh, uh, Mel Tucker is going to have to go get a quarterback for that team to actually get to that next level. Hell, to be honest with you, I, I'd be totally real with you. If he had K McNamara, I would say all right, yeah, they're they're legit. They probably went with like a K McNamara, but that Thorn kid or whatever, he's not going to get the job done for them. But with Michael Penix Jr., it's just can he actually make it through a season healthy? Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. That's a good point. I'm, I think I've yeah. seen that with Penix is he has a tendency of not surviving it. And yeah, that's, that's a great point. I, right now, though, PG, you're right. Statistically, yeah. he's putting up those numbers and not being sacked, meaning he's either getting the ball away or he's just preventing himself from getting sacked and going down. That's a hell of a that's a hell of a move on him as I, well as the offensive line. Or, or, or their offensive line on. is just that I good. didn't it, see. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say I didn't see. I, that's, I mean, it's a good point, PG, because I didn't really see him having this success this early at Washington, to be honest with you, with them having to have a new coach. I mean, it was so much. I mean, there's still a lot of question marks around the program, but at the same time, I mean, I didn't really see him, you know, being that jail piece, but we'll see as they get deeper into Pac-12 play. Uh, Pac-12 play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like to the Tanner Mordecai point, totally get what you're saying, but like with Michael Penix Jr. and, uh, and Tanner Mordecai. Tanner Mordecai right now has the number one receiver in the country in terms of receptions and yards. He has 28 receptions, 491 total yards, three touchdowns, and uh, and and uh, Rashi Rice. And then you have Washington, uh, Michael Penix Jr., number one receiver, Jalen Mc, uh, McMillan, top 20 receiver, uh, 16 receptions, 308 yards, three touchdowns. So. If they keep having these guys that are able to continue pushing out this kind of production, I totally could see them continuing to put up these stats. Yeah, and the good thing for Washington is the only team they really got to face that, that of, of substance is going to be Oregon in, in November uh, when they travel to them. Outside of that, the rest of this conference is pretty light for them. They don't even see USC. They don't see Utah. They've got one of those Iowa schedules, like when Iowa doesn't face Michigan, Michigan State, or Ohio State, and they mm-hmm. win like 11, they go 11-0, and 0 and then get blasted in the uh, conference championship. Yep. So they're looking out. So I say yeah, we this. Were all, to, yeah, we were all talking about Washington or not, not Washington, uh, Oregon or USC to help dominate the Pac-12 with or Utah to be able to come out as a Pac-12 champion and get the Pac-12 mm-hmm. back into the playoffs. Uh, you, people need to watch out because Washington's kind of got a little squad there, especially with the new head coach. And with their schedule, they could potentially try to push and make an argument uh, to be undefeated at the end of the season. I think their problem is is going to be that Pac-12 championship game. Whoever they're gonna have to play there. Yeah, and remember Washington's been to a playoff game before. I yeah. mean, they got destroyed, but they made it. So that's all that matters is they're one of the few teams that's done it. So let's jump Dang. on into the next piece. Yo, go ahead, go ahead. Defense. I'm gonna just say this to open it up. This is one of the best defense I've ever seen at the school. Period. They just right now. I and and I'm I'm no no hyperbole. Some of you may see think that I am being that hyperbolic or whatnot, but look at the way they're holding teams under 17 points a game. I think the average for the season is what uh 13-ish? 10? 10. Is it 10? Have we hit double digits? If they play the way they played this game against Kansas State at the house and holds Kansas State, they may go under double digits in points allowed for the season. They're yeah. they're playing defense that I did not expect to see. So, PG, how are you feeling about this defense? What jumped out to you the most in this game? Yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm loving this defense. I wouldn't go to say uh, yet that they're the best defense I've seen at Oklahoma. Uh, that 2008 defense that Oklahoma had I thought was pretty good. Um, but... 
I was a little sad to not see Reggie Grimes get back there and get any sacks and continue to add that to his uh, resume for this year because uh, I've been on record saying if Reggie Grimes can go out there and get two to three sacks a game, uh, he might give Will Anderson a, a competition for that best defensive player of the year award. But Deshaun White looked really good. I like what we saw Deshaun White outside of that targeting call. Uh, Jaron Kanak looked phenomenal and uh, i believe BV even came yeah i believe bv even came out after the game and said that uh jaron Kanak still doesn't even know what he's doing out there <laughs> so it's all upside from here um you know obviously maybe uh stretching it a little bit there i, I think jaron Kanak knows what he's doing but he, he can fly and, and i think he's gonna be really successful in that cheetah role um ethan downs is just a dude Ethan Downs is just a dude. He he gets back there. He applies pressure. He, he gets to the quarterback. Ethan Downs is going to be a great player. Um, Danny Stutzman kind of fell off a little bit yesterday. He only had four total tackles, and two of those were only a solo. So, uh, But, you know, we continue to see play out of uh, Billy Bowman and Aguebu. I think Aguebu might be the most consistent defensive player that we've had on this team all season in terms of just production and what he's putting out there stat-wise every single game. Chris. How you feeling about that defense, uh, man? Man, defense played lights out yesterday. Um, three man front, like I said, it was it, it kind of worried me at first, but then man, they settled in and they were able to start getting home. I uh, mean, they spread the wealth yesterday. I mean, you you know some of the normal guys like a a a, a Danny Stutzman, guys like that. Uh, they didn't necessarily have the 10, 12 tackles that you're accustomed to or that you've been accustomed to over these past two games, but Man, you saw that they were all consistent. They all did what they needed to do, which was, you know, execute, execute their assignments. Secondary held up really well. Um, this is a classic case. I've said it to both of you guys. This is another classic case or a classic example of this season thus far of OU taking away something that it wanted, uh, that their opponent loves to do. And with this game here, you were able to really take away that vertical threat, take away a lot of the, uh, the passing, that passing game that they want to uh, try to um, go to. They want to, you know, use every down, right? With Whipple coming in here, one of the things that you, you, you were kind of like, okay, is this going to really be a question mark as far as what kind of scheme are they going to come out with? New coach. We already know that, that he's he was a wide receiver coach, so why why wouldn't he and the offensive coordinator come out there and say, hey, we're gonna just air this thing out, right? We're gonna we're gonna do a, a super super emphasized uh, excuse me heavy emphasis on the air raid, right? So you mm -hmm. were able to take that away. You were able to neutralize Casey Thompson, and you were able to really stop their run game as well. I know a lot of us on here we think Anthony Grant is really good and all the rest of that stuff, but they were able to really you know shut that down. Um, you saw Kenneth come in and you saw flashes of what he can do. You were still able to see some talent on the depth chart. Uh, Kanai Walker was out there. Uh, um, you know, it was just an overall really, really good effort by the defense yesterday collectively. Um, Billy Bowman, all those guys that were consistent. Hell, Key Lawrence got a pick yesterday, should have had two. Um, it was a lot of things. But, I mean, there's still some things to clean up. You want to see them uh, – uh, not give up a touchdown like they did on that first drive where it, it just looked like it was blown coverage. But I think, what was it, Harmon? Harmon got beat. But, I mean, one of the things I'm really pleased with with this defense is just the the depth that maybe we don't have true depth right now, but we're building it. And you can see the talent out there. And you can see the talent that was left here with those guys. I mean, people were talking about Kevin Gilliam. You're seeing Clayton Smith out there. Uh, although Reggie Grimes didn't get a sack, he was still a key piece in why Redmond was getting some of his sacks coming off the edge whenever they're, they're, they're running their, I wouldn't say stunts, but they're just running their inside game, right? And it was just really, really cool to see this defense go up there and dominate the way that they did because I'm not even going to mention the old administration, but I will just say this right here. If we had the old coaching staff, going up there to Lincoln, then this game probably worries you a little bit more because we are prone. OU has been prone for the last three or four years to go on to, on road against a team like this and let them hang around for a long time, a little bit too long, a little bit too, and, and be a little bit too close to comfort down the stretch. Right. So you are excited and you're, you're encouraged and you're happy 
have to be really happy with what you saw yesterday from this defense going out there and handling business and not letting this game uh, even be close. Hell, going into the, uh, the the second half, to be honest with you. Yeah, now I could make that same argument about the previous administration with last week too because these are games in previous years, either with Kent State or Nebraska, that OU could have had a chance to lose or would have lost because mm -hmm. Kent State last week had multiple opportunities to put up quite a few points and the yeah. defense came out and made big stops. Same thing against Nebraska. There were points that started turning on a little bit. Defense bolstered up. They bent but didn't break. This is yep. the, the, yeah, yeah. I, I could have made that argument for last week too. That yeah. that Kent State game could have been rough. And I mean, and, and I, I gotta disagree with you on one thing though, Chris. On the okay. depth, I feel like in this game we showed how much depth we really have, and this is why Reggie Grimes has already got four and a half sacks this season, right? So who are you gonna key in on the offensive line? Who are you gonna think about and focus on on that defensive team? Of course, Grimes. You want to stop Grimes because you know he's gonna go out there and get them sacks. Yeah. So instead, Sean White got himself a sack. Ethan Downs got a sack. Two tackles, four loss. Jonah Luau, he got himself a sack. <laughs> Jalen Redmond went out there and got a sack. So it showed that when one guy was focused on, they spread the love and everybody else figured out how to get in there and take his place. That's yeah. something I don't think we've seen from a defense, uh, Oklahoma defense like this in a while. It's usually yeah. that one key dude that does everything. Nick Bonita and Brian Isamoa was probably the two dudes at that point. And then that was it. You didn't really get a lot out of everybody else because the defensive coaching didn't scheme it up to where it's like, hey, you, he's going to be doubled, so let's make it difficult for the rest of the line to figure out everybody else because we know who they're going to key on. That's probably the best thing I've seen out of the scheme or whatnot. Like you said, that three-man front up at first, I was like, hmm, what are we doing? Like, what, what are we trying to figure out? And it feels like that's what both Roof – uh, Brent Venables as well as Levy were doing on their both sides of their ball. They were feeling out the other team to see what they're going to come with, especially because, like you mentioned, PG, this team, and you mentioned this too as well, Chris, this team was completely different than what Nebraska had been doing most of the season. New, re Basically a regime change right there before we play against them. The old tape's kind of old. Only thing you really get out of it is the players, but you don't really get the same schemes out of it. And they're going to use yeah. some of them, but for the most part, they're going to try to change it because obviously that mess didn't work before. Well, of course, the mess didn't work this time around, but the point was they've got to give us a different look. We had to figure out the personnel and who they were going to key in on us, and we did it. And I love that you pointed out how it looks like Venable's team is taking away your best player. I think the one thing that helped us be more successful in this game, and like you said, we all three of us are high on Anthony Grant. Dude's a monster. Over 100 yards every game this season. He hasn't had a single play for negative yards on the run at all this year. So nobody's got him a tackle for a loss this season until he faced us. We held this man 13 carries for 36 mm -hmm. yards. And the crazy thing is they got 163 yards running in the game with 3.6 yards per carry. That's inflated because all of that came fourth quarter. That's when we were kind of just letting up, not trying to, you know, not trying to get anybody hurt, but more so just, you know, letting them do their thing. We shut the, at the half. We only had given up. I think it's actually through midway through the third quarter. We had only given up 226 yards to them. Nebraska averages over 490 yards a game. Exactly. They give up 490, but they average 490 on offense. Mm -hmm. We only gave up, up 220. Like for the game, it was like 300, 300, and, like 40, like what, and, like, and, like 30. And, a, and another point just to kind of point it out as well is, is literally this right here. Um, when Venables was at Clemson last year, who was the team that his defense struggled against? Pitt. Who was That's the true. offensive coordinator for Pitt? Whipple. So I knew I, I was confident in our scheme. Good I was confident in everything. And that's not for me. And, and and please, people who are watching this, please don't think that any of us are saying, oh, yeah, we're we have better defenses than those Clemson defenses. So that's not even a subject right now. But what all that I'm saying is this right here is, is that, look, he's already faced Whipple and he know he has a taste of what, you know, Whipple wants to run. So. It's a with fair point, being, though. It's very yeah. fair. So with that being said, we were able to go out there and neutralize that offense, which is really focused on, in my opinion, is kind of an air raid system. He doesn't really necessarily want to run the ball all that much. I think that was one of the problems that Narduzzi 
uh, the head coach for Pitt had with him on his way out was that he, you know, he sometimes he would abandon the run, but you're mm-hmm. able to go and really take that passing attack away and neutralize them. And hell, you heard um, uh, Joel Klatt, Brady Quinn, all of them just say, I mean, hell, you've pretty much turned Nebraska into a one dimensional team. So uh, with that being said, another point I want to point out is, hey, to everybody out there, look, OU fans, I know we're high and mighty, but we're still going to be humble about it because, hey, it's it's BK State. Hey, it's all about K-State now. We moved on from the win. But I do want to say to all the people out there that I see on Twitter, all the people out there uh, in the spaces and everything, <laughs> hey, y'all can relax off of us a little bit and let us enjoy this victory. It's not that we went up there and beat a bad Nebraska team. It's that we went up there and dominated a bad Nebraska team, and we didn't let this game get out of hand and play close. So We did something we ain't done in years past. We actually put away a team we were supposed to put away. That's the thing. Yeah, but that's that's the problem. Most people, well, a team that, and I'll, I'll pass the UPG, a team that most people, most people had uh had upsetting us uh yesterday yeah and i'll, I'll just say like that's the thing though about the media is oh you will never win i mean we'll, yeah. we can go out there and beat bama like you know and they just be like oh well bama didn't play well oh, i mean OU's offense was just mediocre like that's just <laughs> how it is like we will never get the credit like that we really deserve and when i say credit we really deserve is like i the resurgence of this oklahoma defense like, does people realize right now they're number five in the country in sacks at 13? Now, it's early in the season, and I say that because USC is at number two with 14 sacks. <laughs> <laughs> and we still yeah. have to go to conference play. But, you know, OU is almost top 30 in everything right now on the defensive side of the ball. And that's saying a lot because – Georgia ain't dominating the rankings right now on the defensive side of the ball. Now, their scoring defense is incredible. But, I mean, they're still allowing yards. They're still allowing all of this. So, uh, yeah, they're just not giving us the credit that we deserve in terms of the resurgence of the Oklahoma defense. Because Chris and I talked about it yesterday. Could you imagine what any of these teams over the past couple years would look like with this OU defense or this staff? Like, that 2017 team, when we played Georgia and lost in the Rose Bowl. uh, Oh, this is national championship. Yeah. Um, How how about the year in 2019 with Kyler Murray playing Alabama? We probably could have won the national championship that year, too. That's a potential. That's a potential there. I'll I'll agree with you there as well. I I say that was more potential than anything. 17 was a guarantee. Yeah. Because, and I talked to a buddy of mine that's a big Bama fan. We had kind of talked about it. And, of course, everybody remembers that was the year Jalen Hurts got benched for Tua in the second half when they were losing to go up and win that game. That Bama team was vulnerable. That Bama team was ripe to get beaten in the national championship, and Georgia could not seal the deal. They just couldn't close up. If we had not basically put clamps on the high trophy winner and told him not to go out there and play dangerously in a game against a team that's infamous for coming back on teams because they got two-headed monsters at the running back position that are great in Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle, we would have blown – we should have – 31-14 to 14 was, was, a, was a very good score. We should have won that game 65-25. to 25. But we didn't because we pulled back, put the gas on. We played not to lose instead of playing to win. We didn't put our foot on their necks, and that's what we did in this game against Nebraska. Especially because, and I think that's the one thing that terrifies me about this Oklahoma team, if anything, is that we have to do it all before halftime. Like we've got to put our foot on their neck before halftime, or we may start slowing down in the second half. Now, the Kent State game, we didn't. We blew it up in the third quarter. Then we slowed down in the fourth. Because the one thing that did bother me was that when Bevel went out there, we didn't throw it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a I problem. I don't, to... I don't know why they don't do that. We need to see what we're going to see from these second string quarterbacks. Right. I don't know well, what Jeff Levy's deal is with not wanting to let them throw. So the that's ball. that's but that's Jeff Levy's system. That's his style of ball, though. That's what he wants to do. He wants to 
he'll get up on you. He'll get up by a whole bunch of points, and then boom, it's just, hey, let's run the ball and let's get out of here. We're going to do what we need to do. I don't necessarily think that they're scared of Bevel throwing the ball. He's threw the ball. No. But I think one of the things that you're doing is, hell, I mean, if you're being – if you're able to run the ball – and you're able to, I mean, who's, who's, look, a lot of people have obviously talked about, oh, well, Gabriel being, um, you know, if Gabriel's injured, then what are you guys going to do in this and that or whatnot? I feel fine with what we have behind him. But what I'm saying is I would rather, I would rather some of these skill players get a little bit more, you know, a little more action, especially like Javante Boris. That's a guy who can actually help us. Mm-hmm. Um in the, in the long run, to be honest with you. But yesterday I was perfectly fine with it. Just run the ball. I mean, you're trying to get out of there. And plus with our coaching staff, I, I think y'all already know, Venable's got too much damn respect for the Nebraska program anyways, you know? Because if it was me playing, yeah. you know, playing Madden or something like that or playing, you know, college football, <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> No mercy, baby. Hey, Sweep the leg. No mercy. No I'm mercy. Hanging, I'm hanging a hundred on you. you know what I'm hanging a hundred. No mercy. Yeah. And I, you're right. And I and I think the one thing to add to that is is that with with Levy's system, that run aspect is there to help the defense. That gives them time mm-hmm. to rest, especially when you're churning out touchdowns in a minute and 22 seconds, a minute and 55 seconds, 55 seconds, two minutes and 15. Like most of the touchdowns they're scoring are under three minutes, these drives. And a lot of these drives are long. So the defense has an opportunity to get exhausted because they're not – they're not getting rest, and then you have to rotate a lot of guys. So you're you're fair with that, but my problem with that was, yeah, like you said, if 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 P, if DG gets hurt and we have to play Bevel, what does he look like? Now we know he's probably going to be prepared. He's played college football before. He's played in some games up there at Pitt, but in this type of game in the third quarter, we probably should have finished out at least the entire third quarter with us slinging it and running our high and up-tempo offense for those skills players that don't get to do it often. Like, yeah, Barnes is cool. Barnes is going to be really great. The best part about Barnes, he is DeMarco Murray. That dude's DeMarco Murray, 100%. But if he's not playing in the high-octane offense, if he's not going in that up-tempo, all he's doing is running like in a standard pro set. That's where you start to try. You're not, you're not seeing anything. You're not seeing anything new from him. And that's what I wanted to see a little bit more. I wanted to see him in that actual tempo. I wanted to see them throw it a little, just a little bit. And then you can run, because heck, Oklahoma State, they blew out University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff. I got to watch that game. And Gunnar Gundy went out there in the second quarter because they was beating him so bad in the first quarter. And he started throwing it in the second half. First half, he didn't. He did the same thing that Lebanon was doing. Mike was. They just hand the ball off, hand the ball off, hand the ball off. And then eventually, they start throwing it. They're like, you know what? Let's get some practice in. So this is a great way to get dress rehearsal practice against a team that, you know, technically you can blow out. But the respect for Nebraska is probably the only reason why we didn't throw the ball more. Yeah, and I, I want to go ahead and say this. I mean, we did talk about how, you know, in previous years, you would see Lincoln get up big and then get more conservative on the play calling, and then that's when the defense would falter because, you know, we weren't putting up points, so we weren't continuing to do what we were doing really well, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, I don't know why Lincoln never figured that out, right? It's a, hey, you have a bad defense, so you need to go out there and score as many points as you possibly can. Like, don't ever let up. Um, and, and in some games you saw him have to do that because they would be one point games in the fifties. But my point is this year, you can do a little bit more of that because you have a good defense and you know, your defense is going to be able to get that offense off the field. And you know, you're going to be able to get the ball back. You can go up 49 to seven and go, okay, we're going to run the ball because we're safe. We don't have to, you know, uh, continue to go out there and just put off fireworks. Let's put our guys on the mm-hmm. bench. Let's give them some rest. We got some big games coming up, and let's let our defense do work. Let's let them shine a little bit. Uh, and, but the, also the other thing is, too, we all know that at any point in time, Jeff Lubby can turn up the dial on this offense and go score a touchdown. Yeah. That's super fair. That's super fair. Okay. Let's wrap this bad boy up, and we're going to put a bow on it. AP pole dropped. PG, I know that you are livid. That's why he was laughing earlier. We're not really laughing at Chris. He's laughing at the fact that this poll looking like they look like. I pulled up the poll just to kind of see what he's talking about. Whew. Goodness. AP, um, all right. So, PG, lead us the way. This is your this is your arena. This is uh this is your wheelhouse. Talk to us. W- what got you laughing when it came to this uh this this new poll? Uh yeah. 
Texas A&M is still ranked in the top 25, which, by the way, you guys might be saying, well, well, well they didn't drop them last week. They, it's not like they made it back in. They didn't drop them last week after they lost to an unranked team. Texas is at number 19. I have them at 25, barely making it in. Uh, USC's at number seven. What the hell is that for? But, I mean, you have Arkansas at number 10. And, I, and yes, I know they played Missouri State closer yesterday. I guarantee you Sam Pittman was – or uh, I, is, that, is that his name, Sam Pittman? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're yeah, right, yeah, you're yeah, right, yeah. Sam Pittman. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he wasn't really, you know, play calling all day. You know, they weren't really showing out. But they're better than Kentucky and Oklahoma State and USC. And then not to mention, where the hell is Kansas? Where's Kansas in this? Where's Iowa State? Because Iowa State is a lot better than people thought they were. Not to mention, you leave Florida State out of the top 25? Florida State. Guys, these are teams that have been down for years and all of a sudden are turning it around, and you're leaving them out of the top 25, and they're better than a Texas A&M. And I'll say that because they're winning games. And, you know, Texas lost to Alabama, and they jumped in the top 25. How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. I don't know. I they The, the committee does not have their priorities straight. They still have Michigan State in there. They should be out of it after they lost to an unranked Washington team, who, by the way, only moved up to 24, and I think probably should be a little bit higher than that. I, I, I just – I don't know who makes these rankings and how they do it, but, I mean – they're off their rockers. Georgia wasn't even number one to start the season. If you win the national championship, you should always get to start the season as number one. That's just my opinion. Uh, and I think that's a fair assessment. I think the, the what what pushed, of course, the one thing with Georgia is that they lost so many people. So everybody's trying to figure out if they're going to retool. And obviously yeah. they have retooled. They've shown us. They retooled very well. They had a lot of people. They had a lot of horses in the stable. And they just went out there and just kept winning more of these uh, races. So... I get you with that. So I'm going to push back on the USC part. And I get this. Everyone technically with Oklahoma really hates USC. I'm on the complete opposite side of that. I don't. I don't have any beef with USC. I understood why Lincoln Riley left. And to be absolutely honest, I'm actually glad he left because I feel like we hit our ceiling with him and his regime. I think we were done. It was it was the point. At a certain point, sometimes it's better to break up with that in that relationship and move on to the next because – that next one may have been everything you needed that you couldn't get from the first one. And I feel like we're at correction. We're getting that now because our defense, first off, our offense has scored and beat uh, teams by 30 plus points in the first three games for the first time since 2007. That's a massive gap of us going out and dominating teams that we are supposed to dominate. We talked about this at the beginning of the show. That's the one thing that we've, we've missed out of Oklahoma is beating the teams we're supposed to beat. We're doing that right now. Um, our defense is holding teams 10 points a game is our average right now, just about 10. That's not something we've seen in year, probably since 08, 07. So because of that, we're getting something much better out of this situation than we thought. But USC is really good right now. The blowout of Rice, it's Rice. Of course you expect that. You don't lose to food. Josh uh, Pate says that. Um, but that Stanford win, I thought that was pretty good traveling on the road. And then Fresno State likes to score points, and they lost 45-17. to 17. And Caleb is cooking. I kind of see them as the – I honestly think they're a top-five team in the country right now. Right now. Really? Re no, 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 yeah. no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And this is why And this is why I think the AP rankings are wrong. You, your top ten teams, let's say they're Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, Michigan, Clemson, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Oklahoma State – Kentucky. You, how how many of those teams is USC beating? How many of those teams are they beating? Because I personally I think, don't think they're beating any of those teams outside of maybe Oklahoma State. I see them beating in the top 10. I'm going to look at the top 10 right now from the AFCA coaches poll. 10 Arkansas, Kentucky 9, Oklahoma State 8, USC 7, Oklahoma 6, Clemson 5, Michigan 4, Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia. I think USC beats Arkansas, Kentucky, Oklahoma State, Clemson, Michigan, out of all of those 10, I think they beat those five, no problem. I think Clemson's not good enough this year to beat anybody. I think they struggle with us. I think we struggle with them too. I think that would be the one game we would have a shootout that we didn't want to have. Because um, I think that offense, I think Caleb Williams is just that different, big of a difference maker no, for an offense. I don't, I don't think you do because the whole thing is, is that these teams have been um, trying to run a lot of man 
uh, uh, with them instead of trying to run a too high safety look, trying to do a Makes soft sense. Spill, a soft Fair. Shell zone. Uh, when you're Fair. when you're when you're putting those wide receivers out there on, I mean not those wide receivers, but when you're putting those corners here. Uh, if you break down Lincoln Riley's offense, I saw uh, – shout out to that guy, uh, what's his name, J.D. Piquel. I saw him break down the yeah. offense on his show one day. And basically, Lincoln Riley loves to put stress on those corners. I mean, not the corners, mm-hmm. but the safeties, right? So mm-hmm. basically, he may run – he may run uh, – he may have two wide receivers lined up on the same side, and they're running – it looks like they're running identical routes. They're running twin routes, right? One may do a skinny post. One may break off and do kind of like a, a – like an actual, actual, like an out route or so. So he's putting stress because especially if it's a zone, then you're telling that, that he's telling that safety, he's saying, hey, Caleb, if you see him come up, throw the skinny, <laughs> throw the skinny post. If you see him come down, uh, if, if you see him, uh, excuse me, if you see him come down, throw the skinny post. If you see him stay up, obviously it's the out. He's there, let's pick it up, or let's see if we can get some yak yardage out of it, right? But that's the that's the that's the problem that a lot of these teams have faced. They want to come out there and try to run that man, and nobody has said, "All right, I'm gonna sit here and make you uh, and, and and make die be the hero, right? I'm gonna mm-hmm. make him run the ball and, and run it really well against us. I'm gonna take away this pass game." So the whole thing is, we know that 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 offense has kryptonite. It's just a matter of time of who can actually figure out how to run that kryptonite, right? But fair point. Uh, yeah, I don't necessarily know if we would struggle against them. I don't necessarily know if Michigan would struggle against them because the whole thing is is that, um, Jay, one of the things that you got to remember because we struggle with this down the stretch, what happens when they play a team who says, you know what, screw all this high-powered offense stuff. We're going to hold the ball and we're going to run it down your throat. We're going to be the more physical team. We're gonna run what we want to do, and we're gonna pick up the yardage that we want to uh, we want to pick up. When a team does that, then that's what it will tell us. That that will tell us has Lincoln Raleigh learned his lesson, or is he still doing more of the same? Because if you look at the nope. plays now, if you watch a if you watch a USC game now, any OU fan who watched o- OU over the past four or five years, you could say you could call every play that he's yeah. going to. It's the same stuff that he ran out here at Oklahoma, and mm-hmm. that's my and that's my point. Like I think if he went up against Clemson, because Clemson's defense is still pretty dang good. It's down. I mean, it's down. They don't have, they don't have, they don't have BV there, but they have the they have the talent. That's my thing. I don't think USC is matching up with any of those teams outside of Oklahoma State because all of these teams can do exactly what Chris said, and they can just run the ball down your throat, yeah. and they can control. No, 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 the game and that's fair. You're both fair on that. I, I just, as I, I just, I just feel like we're. I feel like there's a little bit of uh, bias against USC in a lot of assessments no, 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 on no. them because of rank, everyone's collective hate of them. I will rank just, USC. I'm, that's what I'm saying. I will rank USC in there when you know I've seen them play a better team and I can just see that they can do it because I did it with Oklahoma, right? And no, obviously Oklahoma has had the same problems that I'm talking about now. My point is. USC was a five and seven team last year. And then all of a sudden we're just giving them all this credit because they got Caleb Williams, Jordan Addison, Travis, Travis die, Lincoln Riley. Like, no, 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 no. Like you, you still have to go out there and prove that you can play ball. And you still haven't played great competition yet. You're doing this against what I would consider a Stanford. I would consider like Kansas in the big 12. Um, you know, I, I, they they, Ooh, they have. Not I say I wouldn't go that low. I wouldn't go that we'll low. Go on that Stanford. Low. We'll Stanford. That low. Stanford's more of a middle of the road West Virginia. I'd give them a West Virginia of the okay. Big Twelve. They'll have a year where they'll win eleven games randomly, and but they'll hover always in the middle because they're and they're just a team that's a hard fought team that struggles with getting the talent that they need. I, I say okay. they're very well coached. They just they're aren't bowl. as talented they're as everybody bowl. else. Yeah, they're a bowl eligible club. No, I mean yeah. that's the whole thing. Uh, I think the top 25, it is what it is right now. There are definitely some guys who, I mean, some definitely some teams who are about to have some really good matchups coming up soon. Uh, you look at Texas, Texas is going to Texas Tech this weekend. Um, you look at uh, a BYU, I believe they still got Arkansas or somebody on their schedule, right? Yep. Uh, Texas A&M, we're going to find out find out a lot about Texas A&M uh, this weekend as they go up uh, into the battle for Jerry's World, right? Uh, or the second battle for Jerry's World, which, you know, the Red Rivers, I mean, excuse me, uh, Big 12 Championship is always that. But 
uh, they're going to be playing uh, Arkansas this weekend. So you're going to see a lot of those top matchups start coming soon. Uh, I think uh, um, was Oklahoma State have a bye week this week, I want to say, and then they go to Baylor. So you're going to see you, – you're going to start to see some of these matchups and you're going to be able to see some things as well. Hell, to be honest with you, let's just be real about it. From I, I've, I've heard faint, faint, faint rumbling. That USC could be in trouble going to Oregon State. Now, do I believe it? Hell to the no. Could, could it happen? Could it happen? I do. Anything's I do. possible. And Those I only believe it because out. it's it's hard playing in Corvallis. That's yeah. they don't, they 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 play pretty tough at home when you're traveling up there. And and in the middle of nowhere, Oregon, getting into some uh some a little bit of cold action, might start seeing the temperature drop. Yeah, that may be a hard game for them. Yeah, but I think some of the biggest problems with these rankings are this, right? Miami was 13 last week. You dropped them to 25 after Texas A&M beats them. So you're giving basically Texas A&M all of this credit for winning at home against – I mean, I still think Miami's pretty good, right? But then you tell Miami, oh, well, it's like you lost to a crap team, so we're going to drop PG, you to 12 did you spots. see how they played? They I mean, played I, awful. I they know they didn't play great. Score a touchdown. <laughs> I know they didn't play great, great but Texas A&M didn't team. play great either. Texas A&M didn't play Texas great. Texas A&M didn't play great either. But if you want to just keep, if you just want to keep fo- keep the focus on uh, on Miami, Miami didn't play near as well as anybody thought that they could have. They they I don't even know if they actually showed up. That could have been right. some monsters last night. They played terrible last night. And I and I get you, PG, on on the way they dropped them. But at the same time, you got to remember. Miami just lost to a team that lost to Appalachian State at home. That kind of, to me, yeah. hurts your credibility when you travel there too. And an App and State then, goes out and beats them, beat up yeah. on them. Miami is supposed to be way more physical than they are, and they show no physicality. Yeah, in but game. then where's the credibility with having Texas A&M at number 20? That's because not that's my point, thing. Because the point is you take their season as a whole. Go back and look at the second game of the season. They struggled with that team as well. They they Miami struggled with that team as well. Miami had no business winning that game, but they ended up winning it. So the whole thing is, is that you're going to penalize them off of coming off a sloppy a sloppy win, and then going in there to Texas A and M against a team who was reeling, a team who just lost to Appalachian State, and now you're 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 not going to sit here and tell me that Miami should shouldn't have dropped that far. Miami hasn't done anything this year to really show that they haven't been consistent. And I think that's what these these uh, these rankings are showing. They're trying to give more honors to the to the consistent teams. Now, I do agree with your point. You would think that a Kansas will be ranked, seeming that they beat what uh, a top twenty five Houston. Um, uh, they went to West Virginia and won, which is a really good win. You throw the Tennessee Tech win out the door, but I mean, they you would think that they'd be ranked. The hell, they they got to be somewhere close. But Kansas has had time, a more credible schedule yeah. than half the people in the top 25. Well, they got a chance yep. to go and prove it this week. They got Duke this week. They got a chance to go prove it. So go go do it. Because the whole thing is history is not on their side. Yeah, yeah. it's not. But, I mean, it's not. But if we're talking about sloppy play, then how can you put Florida in the top 22? Because Florida is awful. Florida, I don't think, is very good at all. Yeah. I think Florida is not a very no, good. No, 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 that's Michigan fair. State. That's fair. They're riding, they're riding high off of that uh, Utah win. Utah and in win. my personal yeah. opinion – Utah is still would I would have them as a favorite in every game plan against them even going forward. Yeah. But and then like and then I look at and then I look at the votes, right? So you see other receiving votes at the bottom. How the hell is Notre Dame getting two votes? <laughs> you know you got some homies. They want a game, stuff. man. That's it's why. The it's it's the riders. It's the riders. And that's the reason why you say, look, it's all red I get it. until November. To the middle of November, when you get those CFP, uh, those, yeah, the CFP uh, votes or whatnot, that's all that matters. To be honest with you, yeah, I, yeah, that yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I just look at. I it hate the polls. When, yeah, when you rank the rankings, it should be okay. I'm ranking Georgia number one, right? Are they better? Like, do I think they'd be Alabama in a one-on-one matchup? Yes. Okay, Georgia's ahead of Alabama. That's how. That's how these games should be ranked. That's how these teams should be ranked. Not not a oh well. Miami lost to Texas A&M, and Texas A&M won, so we're going to move them up a little bit and drop Miami all the way down. No, it's a, okay, well, do you think Texas A&M could beat Texas? 
No, and and I, I get you. I'm I, I and that's fair. And the one thing I hate about polls is I hate that we do a poll before the fifth week of the season anyway. I my I've always been in the the company of we shouldn't rank teams until week five. That way we don't have these inflated jumps up and down because they beat a team that's ranked that probably should not have been ranked to begin with. Uh, I am hardcore on that. I think honestly, when the college football playoff ranking comes out, I think that's too late. I think you should have something a little bit earlier. Week five is to me the safest week to start ranking teams and getting an understanding of who is actually better than who. And yeah, I, I'm, I, I try not to argue or get too mad about the polls because of that. But, yeah, th- they have to have something for us to talk about when we're making content. So we're going to wrap yeah, this bad funny boy that up. I'm getting, it's funny I'm getting upset about the top 25, yet it really doesn't matter because, you know. You <laughs> right, right, right. It's, it's, just something to get, it's something to get us worked up with and some of us to make content over. So I do appreciate yeah. this content that we can argue about, and it's always worth it. So we'll wrap it up. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me here on Unfair Sports. Please let the people know where they can find you. Chris, where can they find uh, you in the Horns Down podcast? Hey, guys, you can find us at the Horns Down podcast on YouTube. You can also find us at the Horns Down pod on Twitter. Follow that. Follow my guy at Seth Oliveris. You see my Twitter handle on the screen. Find us at uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts at. Check us out. Yep. Sweet. PG, the PG show. Let people know where they can find you. Yeah, y'all can find me on Twitter uh, at the PG Show underscore. Uh, you guys can also find me on YouTube, Google, Apple, Spotify, uh, just the PG Show. And uh, go Baker Mayfield. Go Panthers. Yeah, hopefully the Panthers give me some money today because um, I did pick them as well. Thanks for tuning in as usual. With that, we'll chop it up with y'all in a few days. Peace. <laughs>